right, good morning. Welcome to the week four of living in the light of man's chief end. My name is Steve Fuego. Thank you for being here today. I'm so glad to be talking about this topic. This is one of those topics that I've been looking forward to and being afraid of at the same time since the beginning of uh, putting this class together. I think this is one of the seminal conversations we will have that will really help us all through the rest of the pre uh, our time together in this topic. I'm going to start off with a really bold question after I pray, and then, uh, and then we will just dive right into a conversation. This will not start with a lecture. It will start with actually an interaction. So let's open up a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so blessed to be here, be here with your children, and be with you, and to worship you together. It's something I know that we just take for granted, and that's just something that we just do on a weekly basis, but yet to understand its profound implications to all eternity, um, it's really amazing to think about what's happening this morning. Thank you so much for being a part of our lives and making us available to each other. We pray that we will inform and encourage each other today. We pray that your spirit would be alive within our hearts and minds. Lead us into truth, dear Father, and protect us from, from error. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Big, bold question. What makes a good life? Wow. We think about all the things that we could be doing with our lives. What makes a life a good one versus a not so good one? You ever thought about this? I think it seems to be a pretty important question. So what makes a good life? Yes, John. Peace of mind and sausage. Peace of mind and sausage. <laughs> all right, there we go. Anytime you throw sausage into anything, it just kind of like covers a multitude of sins or at least profundity. What else? Besides peace of mind and sausage. Yes, Brian. Love and marriage. marriage, yeah. Marriage is a very big part of our lives, and it actually brings a lot of joy and sometimes some not so much joy. <laughs> yeah. What else? What else makes a good life? What's that? Family. Family. Yeah. Good health. You know, we think about it at the very end of our lives, this is going to be a question, you know, did I live a good life? And uh, it's a very important question. We ask a lot of questions about do I, have an, a, do I buy the right car, you know, do I have the right health insurance, those kinds of things we ask. Sometimes we never stop and ask the main, the main question at all. Is my, am I living a good life? I think most of us are just kind of just barreling through life, aren't we? Just trying to get from point A to point B, and kind of get the day through, get the bills paid this month. And we just kind of step into life this way, don't we? Yes. Yeah. And that really is kind of the basis of all modern psychology. If you ask any psychologist, that say, what is what really motivates man? It's the avoidance of pain and the promotion or the pursuit of pleasure. And uh, I think you can ru you run all the way back to Plato and Aristotle. They talked about the exact same thing. This has been one of the major tenets of our existence. I think most of us, like we talked about the Goethe quote last week, if you guys remember that, there's another one, Thoreau, this came up when you, were you and I were talking, right, the Thoreau quote, men live lives of quiet desperation. Um, is that a lot of us just do that. We just kind of get through life, and uh, we never ask the fundamental question, am I living a good life? Yes, Darren. Yeah. Exactly. And we find out those have higher goals and higher aspirations, and we feel like there's something much more meaningful to that than just, do I have a, enough money for retirement? Those are the questions. And this is the reason why we're having this conversation, because all of our decisions get mo moved and motivated by our value system. That's why this uh, presentation is so important. Thinking about the lives that you would envy and admire. What do you think about uh, the Bradys? Uh, Tom's kind of sitting on top of the world right now with a big, huge win in the Super Bowl last weekend, last, last Sunday night. Is this a prized life, a praised life? Would you like to be the Bradys and have a 20,000 square foot mansion just winning the Super Bowl and being married to a Brazilian supermodel or being the Brazilian supermodel who makes about 40, 50 million dollars a year just for showing up for half a dozen photo shoots? 
and living with a guy who's actually probably the most celebrated athlete in the world. Yes. There you go. Love, success, and fame. Right in that, right, right in that picture, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, then we'd actually look at this and say, wow, these guys have a pretty much a prized life, don't you think? Wouldn't it be nice if they would walk into Brady's shoes for a few days, a few weeks, a few months, a few years, and have all that the world brings to them? What about this person? A praised or a prized life? How many would love to live in, the, in, the, uh, in Calcutta in the slums? And that would be your life. And eat with just having one single bowl and having just a couple of things to wear. I have really no worldly material goods at all. Is this a praised or a prized life? We admire it, don't we? But we don't envy it. Isn't that interesting? What about this life? George and Amal Clooney. I heard they were having twins or something. I think it came out this week. Yeah, that's what I heard. Okay. Is, is this a praised or a prized life? George Clooney. I mean, most of us would probably say, wow. A lot of women I've heard say, I'd love to be married to George Clooney. And Amal is a, an accomplished uh, attorney. Wow. Praised or prized? What about this life? Praised or prized life? So something, uh, do you envy this life or do you admire this life? Yeah, would you like to be Lincoln? Did you see the death of your child? Being married to a, a woman who is suffering from mental illness? Being faced, trying to keep a country together in the middle of the bloodiest war in the history of the United States? See a picture of him in 1860 versus 1865 is remarkable. And then to ultimately meet the, uh, an assassin's bullet. Praised or prized life? Envied or admired? What about this gentleman? Same kind of story as Lincoln. <laughs> being thrown in jail, being mocked all the time. An amazing gift for oration. Wonderful visionary ultimately met with the assassin's bullet. We actually would admire him, but probably not envy him. What about this couple? A praised or prized life? Do you want to be the Obamas right now? Uh, now they're out of office, probably. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're probably having a little bit more fun just sitting around drinking coffee in the mornings and all this stuff. Their children are growing up. They're probably having an adult playground happening where they can just do the things they want to do. Praise your prize. It's probably a little smattering of both. There's some good things we know of the Obamas that we admire. And so parts of their lives we envy at this point. They seem to have all they need to take care of themselves for the rest of their life. What about this couple? Donald and Melania. Praised or prized life? Good question to ask, isn't it? What, where do we get these things? Do I want to have a prized or a praised life? Or both? What does it take to have a praised life and a prized life? A life to admire or a life to envy? Well, our, our culture tells us a lot. And also the scriptures tell us a lot. And we're going to try to sit there and see what they both point to. This is a really important question. What what makes what ma what is the con constituent? I mean, the constitution of a good life. This is really the conversation we're having today. Remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to actually answer this question and apply it to our lives. What is the chief and highest end of man? Man's chief and highest end is to glorify God and fully to enjoy Him forever. Here's where we are in our study. When we're week four, we're just about to finish up my chief end of my existence. Why do I value what I value? Next week, we start talking about choices, getting very practical right into the dailiness of life. Why do I do these things over these things, and how does it match up with my chief end? So hopefully, we'll have enough of a back base, baseline 
developed so that these questions would be a little bit easier to ascertain and uh, be able to answer. I love this quote here. Okay, from Roy Disney, of all people. That's a great one. When your values are clear to you, making decisions becomes easier. We find out that it's our values that really decide, that really drive the decisions we make about what we do in life. Sometimes we don't even know what our values are. We just kind of respond to things emotionally, really without any kind of understanding of what those emotions are being driven by. But we feel them deeply and they feel very real. So we actually interpret them as being truth sometimes and we actually it could be a misplaced value. This is where we talk, follow your conscience. We hear Hollywood talking about that a whole lot. Your conscience is an accumulation of all the experiences that you have had over your life, the things you've been told, the things you've been told to value, the things that you have experienced and saying this works, this doesn't work, and your conscience gets filled with that. What if your conscience was filled with a lot of bad ideas? Listening to it would be kind of a stupid idea. A lot of times we think that's the ultimate way to get to the most uh, abiding truth is just to listen to our inner selves. If our inner selves do not have much su substance to them, what's there to listen to? John Mayer, the famous uh, pop singer, said this, there are people in the world who have the power to change our values. There is more truth in this statement than you can ever imagine. Our values are shifting constantly. By your being in this class this morning, your value system will shift based upon the way you act and react to what, what's being told. Either you say, this is good stuff, your, your, your value system will start moving toward our conversations we've had. If you start looking at it and say, this is danger here, your value system will tell you to back off and don't absorb this stuff, and you'll probably become much more strident against some of the things we talk about today. But your value system will be affected by this conversation, positively, negatively, whatever. So... This is important. This is a negative thing. We should look at it negatively. Is that I, with people I walk with, the things I read, the things I experience in life are informing my value system every day. But it also tells us that our effect in the world is dynamic. The world is changed by our inserting our value system into it. So there's a positive and a negative. To this statement so sometimes we look at negative we all run away and screaming and, and go cl climb into a hole no the best thing to do is to say i know what it is now let me go and use it strategically that's really what we've been called to in the christian life does this make sense you guys with me okay did you get to take this test uh, online anybody get a chance to take the test that i sent out an email to everyone if you haven't taken, I like the online version of it. This is mine, actually. Uh, I took it, uh, actually, last night again for the second time. Came up with the same answers. Interesting. Um, what's really cool about this test, and if you don't have this URL, there are, um, there's some printouts of the test in the handout section on the, on the ping pong table. Be, uh, feel free to pick up if you didn't get one last week. Um, and and uh, it's got the URL on it. And this is a, a company out of the UK, the, the Barrett uh, Group, um, Barrett Value Center. Um, they put this out, and it's really kind of nice. It's really simple, almost feels almost disarmingly simple as to what you got to do with it. But actually, it's very, it's very prescient if you really pay attention to it. It really shows you a lot of neat things that, wow, okay, I see this. I see some patterns that I had not noticed before. And that's really helpful. But the, the last two pages of, your hand, of the uh, email they send back to you in the has the little worksheets. Those worksheets are really fantastic. My encouragement to you is just don't take the online you know, thing and look at your, where your value system is, how it's built, but to also work those two sheets in the back, and you'll be glad you did. It gives you a chance to really do some hard soul searching about what's really valuable to you in the moment. Any questions on it? Was anybody surprised by it? Yeah, what's up? Um, this is the test on a, it's, it's kind of on the Yeah. They just uh, actually choose 10 words, and then they'll tell you exactly what, what that means. If you, those, 10, those 10 words you are, um, that you're most as associating with your value system. They'll tell you exactly where, you're kind of where your mentality is at the moment and your values. It's it's really kind of figuring out how many SATs, right? Yeah, so I, hope, I wish the SATs were that easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice little light test, which is fun. Yeah, it's really cool. 
But if you haven't taken the test, I encourage you to do it right after church. Just get it done. You'll be glad you did. I think it really is helpful. Uh, we'll have a chance to talk with each other about what we've learned in just a second. But here's a big question we need to ask ourselves is how did we come by the values we currently have? How were we informed? How has our value system been informed? Now, the field that we're studying here is called value theory or axiology, is how Aristotle put it. Um, and we're really running all the way back to Aristotle and Plato on the basis of this, but yet it's still evergreen today, some of the things they talked about when it came, comes to value. They basically say that there are really two big elements that contribute to our developing of value. The first thing is our moral development, learning what the right and the good is. Okay? That comes from our families, from the Boy Scouts, if you were in the Boy Scouts. What, is a good th what are good things to do? What are right things to do? We call this morality. Another thing that may surprise you that really helps us develop our value system, and it's often overlooked in the American culture, is the effect of aesthetics. Beautiful things, things that attract us, art, movies, books, all these things have a wonderful, powerful effect on building up our value systems as people. This is why it's really good to read really good books. Not just any books, good ones. Good ones that have a lot of fantasticness to them. It really gets into the human soul. And I know that I'm, I'm kind of a geek in this area, but you know, some of the great authors that just, just know human nature, like Shakespeare and, and Charles Dickens and Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and all these guys are just fantastic. I encourage you to read some of these guys because it's just the way, the, the, the way that they describe life and the way people act and react and interact <coughs> gives you a wonderful understanding of what really is true and abiding. And sometimes our art is one of the best ways to get people to understand. Matter of fact, this is my favorite painting by Vincent Van Gogh. Got to see it for the first time in my life <coughs> in December. I went to the uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York with Beth and got to see it. It was a moment. And I found out there were 740 other people having a moment with me and uh, <laughs> kind of took the old specialness away. It was pretty much filled up room looking at Van Gogh's Starry Night. Let me tell you why I like this painting. I don't know if I've ever explained this painting to you the way I see it. This is my interpretation. I don't know if Van Gogh, he never wrote about this, uh, but this is just the way I read it. I look at the, the yellow is the glory of the, of the, of, of the skies. And so you just, see how you just spun the glory around? I think this is probably just the, uh, the Milky Way, just the gorgeousness of the glory. And even look in, this, in the towns, See all the houses with their lights are all bright and gold, showing the love and the glory of the, of the family life. And what was really telling is that the one building in the, whole ch uh, in the whole city that doesn't have orange and gold lights is the church. They're black and cold. Wow. To me, that reminds me, as I look at this thing, is that Boy, that should be just like bright, glowing the best and brightest, you know? And yet I think Van Gogh is probably speaking to his heart as that's where he did not see the glory of God as in the church itself. And I think that's tragic. So this painting reminds me of that tragedy. I don't know if that was intentional or whether he said, oops, I just got ran out of yellow and didn't finish off the, uh, the windows in the church. It seemed to be much more strategic than that. It's way too weird that he would not have done that with, unless it was intentional. Yes. Oh. Back then, they didn't have to worry about it. They put candles, the priests lived there, and everything else. <laughs> this right here, this is a tree. This is a tree. This is a tree. So beauty and aesthetics have a way of in, informing us and in building up our value systems. 90 plus percent of what we learn from authority figures, uh, we learn from authority figures as to what to value. Over nine-tenths of what you know and you value is from the authority figures in your life. Whether it's your parents, your culture around you, family has a huge value system here, our culture, everything around us. 
And so we have to understand that this is where a lot of it's coming from. That's why I put that 11 by 17 spreadsheet together. Let me tell you about that project. <laughs> uh, feel, do not feel compelled to read the whole thing unless you really want to read it. I'm kind of trying to figure out um, uh, contrasting the American cultural value system to the, the biblical value system and trying to see where they're similar and where they're dissimilar. So I've been doing a lot of research over the last two years trying to come up with some way of working this. And this is my first attempt to communicate it with that spreadsheet. And I uh, spent about several hours on it yesterday to the chagrin of my wife, uh, trying to see if I can get this ready for you guys today. But this is something I've been thinking a whole lot about. If any of you have ever thought about this and would love to have a conversation about it, I would love to talk to you. I'm trying to figure it all out. I probably need, need some more brain power. Uh, but there is, is some things that we have mixed together. The Americanism, Americanisms we take almost as if they're gospel. There's a lot of things in the American culture that really contradict or countermand the scriptural teachings and what we really should be valuing in life. And that's the reason why I was going to do that, that project. So now you see kind of in the back of in the back, well, in the back rooms of my head what I've been working on. But because this is a big issue, much of what we value is informed by our culture. Uh, remember, we talked about this in the very first week about the, the, the story of the prodigal son. You guys remember this? And we showed it to three different groups of theologians. To the Americans, they said the real problem with the prodigal son was that he squandered his property. Remember, they showed it to the Russians. The Russian uh, theologians said, no, 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 it was because there was a severe famine in the land. Well, that's a real problem that created uh, the prodigal son's problem. And then we showed it to a group of uh, African uh, theologians. They said, no, 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 it's this right here. No one gave him anything. All three of them are in the scriptures. We read it as squandering. That's the American way because it really fits in with the American cultural dynamic, how we see ourselves. And yet, if you talk to the, the Russians, this is really fits into their dynamic and their history, is that they have really faced a lot of famine in their lives. And if you talk to anyone in, the, uh, uh, you know, in Africa, they're very much a, a community-based, uh, you know, a, a community-focused uh, culture and sharing is a big deal to them. So that was the real fall falling point of the prodigal son. Isn't that interesting? How three different cultures can interpret the exact same scripture. Here's another example of interpretation. We see this a lot during graduation, this verse. You probably see this verse with graduation, haven't you? Yeah. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. We read that and we look at that as a personal you. God's talking directly to me on this, don't we? That's a very American thing to do. Let me show you why. This is the top of the verse. <laughs> this is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years. You're about to get swept up into slavery. But then I will come, up, come and do you all the good things I have promised, and I will bring you home again, for I know the plans I have for you. He's basically saying, I am throwing you into harm's way for 70 years. And it's not you, it's the whole, it's not just about, you know, Elias and the group of uh, Hebrews. It's the whole Hebrew community I'm throwing into slavery. See how we read in America, we Americanize everything we read in the scriptures? When you take it and put it into an actual perspective, it really tells us a whole lot. I've done this so many times. I've had Bible studies. I'll ask this question in a Bible study. What does this verse mean to me? What does this verse mean to you? Let's have a conversation. What happens? That actually gets us to read the scriptures improperly. Because there are some of them that aren't directed just toward one person. Matter of fact, most of the commands of scripture are universalistic or collectivistic. In other words, they were said to you all, in a good southern way, not to you specifically. This is the best way of saying this phrase. What does this verse mean? Take it for what it is, because a lot of times we Americanize and individualize everything in the scriptures that causes us to twist and distort things. And we start taking promises out of their context without all the things it's really trying to do. And we actually develop for us a straw man of a theology that doesn't really truly exist. And we, ask, and we hold God to promises he never actually made. There are thousands of Christian denominations, sects, and movements in the world. And guess what? Each thinks they are more biblical than everyone else. 
well, of course, we're, we're Presbyterians. We're more biblical than everyone else. Right? Come on, fess up. But guess what? The Baptists down the street are saying the same thing. We're more biblical. I was just reading a book about Joseph Smith of the Mormons. He thought he was being more biblical than even the Presbyterians or the Baptists. We say Mormons, more biblical. That's what his perspective was. He was restoring the old-time gospel is what he thought he was doing and creating Mormonism. What? He talked to the Pentecostals. They think they have a better bead on the Christian, on on biblical teaching. We have some family that's in the holiness movement right now, and it's pretty interesting. They think they have got it all figured out, and I've been missing the boat theologically all along. It's pretty funny. Interesting, I question whether it's true. And then I look at some of the way they teach things, and I go, well, maybe not. Right? This should humble us and make us really self-doubt, filled with self-doubt. I don't want you to self-doubt to the point of despair. I want you to self-doubt to the point of dependence on God and the Holy Spirit. But we have a lot of things that are baked into our value system that are really thwarting our understanding of what God's truly trying to do in this world, or what, how my good life should be. That's a really important part of this conversation. Here's our biggest problem. We have a confirmation bias. Anybody ever heard this term before? It's a logical term. Is Henry, you know this term. Can you unpack a little bit of it for us? What does it mean? Yes. And it actually serves as a, as a self-filtering process, too. I have a, I have a bias towards a, an opinion. I read everything, I see everything from that opinion's point of view. So if, what's that? Exactly, all this, and it's really kind of funny, it's like if you are, well we saw it in the 2016 election, I mean it was crazy, the confirmation bias on both sides. Every side has said, I know what's right. Don't give me all that stuff the other guys are talking about, we know what's right, and anything they say, I interpret it through what I already know. You see, no one was really listening to each other. We're actually using what we currently know as to filter out anything that's in disagreement of it. We do this also scripturally and theologically. We have a confirmation bias. We look at things and say, this is the way things are, but we never fundamentally ask the question, am I looking at this thing rightly? And it's causing our value systems to shift. I think a lot of the anxieties we feel in the American church is because American culture has caused us to shift our definition of God's gospel towards something that really is way off the mark. And that's why many of us are anxious and in despair. Because we have mixed in some things that just don't belong there. That's kind of scary. How do we pull it all out? That's what the next four weeks are all about. How we actually read into life the things, be able to pull into these things and make sense of it all. Can a life live to glorify God and enjoy him forever? Be both a praised and prized life. What do you think? Should it be? And can it be? Should this be the life we should be prizing and praising? I have one, one little positive nod over here. Anybody else think? I could be totally whacked out. Maybe this is really the stupidest idea in the world. No, there's no way. It's about money, fame. Everything Henry just told us about. Yes, that's it. And this is really what we should be really setting our value system toward, looking at people and say, wow, they're glorifying God, enjoying him forever. They're enjoying him forever. They're glorifying God and enjoying him. I'm glorifying God and enjoying him. That's the, forget the Clooney life. Forget the Obama life. Forget all these other lives. This is the praised and prized. This is the enviable and the admirable. And that is really an interesting thing. You see how even my mission is to you, you may get a little uncomfortable. That's because it's kind of at war with our value system. Let me tell you a little bit about your value system. It's, it's a hugely emotional in, its, in the way that attacks life. When your value system feels under attack, you get very emotional. Those emotions are very strong and powerful. 
And so as we go through this, it's constantly working through our reason and through our just, just the compelling nature of the argument that we actually inform our emotions to, to really rise up to what we wanted them, them to be. Yes, Henry. Yeah, she actually, she went through some very dark, dark spirits, spirit of times. But I think the point, she probably enjoyed God more than even we do in the American church. I know she wrote some very dark letters. I know I've read those letters. Glorifying God, what is it? It's revealing his value to the world. Remember, he does not need glory to feed him. That actually is a Greek notion that the gods actually benefited from our praise and our glory and our prayers. That came from Mount Olympus, not from, not from, the, not from, from God. And so what he's saying is, I want you to glorify me, not because I need the glory, but because I can sh- if the world can understand my value, I can actually let them have a praised and prized life. This is this formula for this. There's two things working. Showing our good works, which is the moral code that we actually apply to the world, which is from uh, Matthew, and then celebrating his beauty using aesthetics to celebrate God's glory and that will, uh, God's, who God is, and that helps people appreciate God even the more. Remember, we talked about this verse very early in, the, in our conversation, is that glory is to add weight, significance, value. And, and Matthew 5, 17 gives us the clearest example of this about glory and God. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That is the best way to glorify God. Is show off God, the good works that we do is saying, this is, we do this because of our God. That they will see the good works and glorify. A lot of times the only voice and the only thing we show them is a, an angry, vindictive church that's always shaking its fist in the face of the world, saying, you guys are evil, wrong, Stop it, or God is going to punish you. God is gl- glorified by that. What is he glorified by? Good works. Interesting, isn't it? I think a lot of the tenor of our conversation to the world is actually diminishing the glory of God as opposed to supporting it, building it up. Where is all the great Christian art? From our generation. Talk about the aesthetics. We have gone silent here, I think, as a whole. Think of uh, the things. This right here is Mark Chagall's uh, 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 stained glass windows. This is from the Art Institute of Chicago. You guys got to see this. It's a beautiful room. You can stay here for four hours and soak in it. It's just beautiful. Chagall at his best. But uh, I would love to have, wouldn't those be great windows to have in the church? <laughs> those are just so refreshing and so deep and so stirring. Um, I love his touches of blue and gold and green. It's just gorgeous. Why aren't we doing this kind of art? We used to. The church led art for hundreds of years. And I think through all of our iconoclasm and all this stuff, we kind of shut the whole game down, thinking this was not important. But we know that aesthetics is a great way of building value in the hearts of men. And yet we have cut that off at the knees, the church has. Why isn't our music just absolutely leading why aren't we, the Grammys, lining up to put our artists in every category? Because our art is so much better than everyone else's. Our music is just, oh, man, if only Kanye knew how to write like that. You know, but yeah, we are the ones, it sounds like our music is still coming from the 90s. We're about 20 years behind when it comes to just the beauty and the, where, the, where the music is today. Occasionally you get a couple of Christian artists that have really stepped into expressing themselves through modern music, but it's been really kind of bad. And what happened to all the great orchestral music? What about the great books? What a way to glorify God. We're going to talk a lot this about C.S. Lewis and what he wrote about this. We get into art and nature in four, in four weeks. We're going to talk a lot about how we can become almost like, um, uh, well, well, I'm not going to spill it. It's going to come in four weeks. It's great stuff, so just hold on tight. Then we enjoy him forever. Glorifying God, this is how we do it. We do it through our good works. 
and we create beauty that surrounds it, and we tell the story of God and his great story of grace, how Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, and we tell it in, much, in compelling ways, like Aslan, that story. That was one of the great pieces of Christian literature, isn't it? Or even the Lord of the Rings. So much Christian doctrine in the Lord of the Rings. And J.R.R. Tolkien told that story in such a beautiful way. That mythology is beautiful. You really break it down and understand the great Christian themes in, Tolstor, I mean in, in Tolkien's work. It's like, man, this guy was brilliant. He truly understood and got the, the uh, orthodox faith. Enjoying him forever is just simply allowing yourself to be with God. Don't treat him as some abstraction. Lean into his life. Do we absolutely know with certainty and are aware with certainty that God is among us in this moment, in this room? The very creator of heaven and earth, Jupiter, the moon, the galaxies, he's present and listening and involved and active right now. And someone to enjoy God is just to lean into that, know that it's not a threat or he's not here to hammer us He's here to be with us. God with us, Emmanuel. This is where he wants to be, with his people. And it brings him great pleasure. Ephesians 1. How many can enjoy that? How many can really enjoy God? We almost treat him as something we just have to take or some kind of a construct we have to accept. One of the most beautiful verses in the Bible, Psalm 1611 says this, You made known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Look at the mountains and see the God of the mountains. Look into the sky and see the God of the sky. Go into the sea and see the God of the sea. Look into a child's eyes and see the creator of that child. For that's where God is residing everywhere. It's a beautiful thing. Enjoy God. I'm going to give you permission to do that today. You guys want to? That's the that's praise and prize for life. Forget everything else. Thomas Aquinas was once was praying in one of the, in the cathedral. Um, and somebody came up to him and said, what are you praying about? I said, I just want to pray that I can know God, he can know me. That was his prayer for that day. I just want to know God for him to know me. He was sitting there in front of the, of the, of the sanctuary, and that was just his prayer for that day. I think it's a brave, wonderful prayer. It shows you how in touch he was with just enjoying him forever, just to be in that moment. How many times do you go into prayer just saying, I'm hanging out with my best friend? The person is my best friend I'm having a conversation with. I'm pulling away. I'm going to go off into the woods or even go into the back room. Or no one else can disturb my conversation with my best friend. Enjoying him forever. Wow. He's totally cool with that, actually. Remember, we were talking about Makarios for all along as being the blessed, flourished life, flourishing life, is that this is the word that's used in the... Um, uh, in uh, the, uh, the Beatitudes in, in Matthew chapter 5. It's a beautiful word, and it's a state of being, not just where in the destination. It's, you will be blessed. You know, blessed is in these moments of poverty. Blessed is these moments when we're mourning. Blessed is these moments when we're trying to create pre- peace. Blessed are these moments. You're already flourishing in these moments. It's not, you're not enduring and suffering to get to a blessed moment. And blessedness is free of suffering. Blessedness is the suffering itself. That is really radical thinking for American, American minds, isn't it? That the blessedness, the flourishing, is not so much in the overcoming of suffering, but the actual suffering itself. Whoa. Now I see how much of my American culture has un- informed my thinking where it's all about eradication of suffering is where true happiness is. Rick, to your point.
Yeah. Um, when Lauren, your sister, and I'll go back to what I said, you have to understand then that our justice is no just in this country. This is a perfect of all that suffering in this country. Why would you have to put this over this? Because it amounts to not just suffering, but suffering. The result of it is not the people and so forth in this country, but it's the society. Yes. And so I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It makes total sense. Yes, Henry. Yes. Yeah, we got two weeks at the very end of that. We're talking about suffering, actually, evil itself. Those are evils that are per- perpetuated by our own actions and evil that's not completely, un- has no connection at all to our behavior. Uh, we're going to talk about those two things, and that's exactly where Henry's heading with this conversation, exactly where we'll, we'll unpack that for two weeks. Any questions? Has this been helpful, this conversation? For me, this was the most important conversation. Of all the weeks of pre- preparation, this one hit me upside the head the hardest. I realized how messed up my value system was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. I tell you, what, so it's so um, difficult for us to get that mindset. Uh, I think it's going to take intentionality you know, for all of us because our culture sp- fi- fights against us thinking that way. So, yes, Henry. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, we are on the back side of it, and we feel that it's pain because we are, the, our culture seems to have surpassed us. We're becoming more and more irrelevant to the culture. They see nothing that we're saying about our faith that really is of any importance, and that's, that should be troubling for us. Yeah. I yeah, know. And that's our fault because Christianity is extremely relevant. We just have, uh, we've been very poor. Our, co- our, our generation has been very poor at really carrying the torch. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Good thought. Good thought. Well, I do want to, uh, to protect your time, I want to say thank you for being here next week. All right. Got to love that. Any kind of kitten picture. Uh, go, your homework is actually go somewhere and play like a kid again. We're going to talk about work and play next week. Um, so <laughs> I think it's some, uh, best hit me. Best, be, oh, sure, he left. My wife said, Steve, we just don't play anymore. And this was yesterday. I was working so hard on this. 
And I started thinking, I'm not about to talk about it. And I go, oh, man, this is so sh- shocking. So this is actually more of a homework for me. But there's so much of our lives that we just don't allow ourselves to play. I'm going to make a very strong case that we should be playing it even more vigorously than we do. And that it actually is a very strong spiritual discipline. And also is work. Okay? But it's fascinating how the two are so in, in, inextricably tied together when you look at them. So I'm really excited by this. So I do want to encourage you, have fun this week. Wang Chung this week. Everybody, Wang Chung. Okay? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for the encouragement you give us from your scriptures. We pray, dear Father, we would be these uh, voices and these people in this world that will, can affect the, the value systems around us because of how much we love you and enjoying you and how much we're glorifying you by the good works we put before people. Thank you for these people. I pray for a blessing on them and their family. We pray for this uh, upcoming uh, worship service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much.